Um, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to listen to Eva Gladek, uh, was already announced. She's a native of New York City and she's an industrial ecologist, passionate about sustainability. It's full of passionate people here. And her work integrates knowledge from across the natural and social sciences to develop innovative solutions uh, in sectors as diverse as agriculture, electronics, and information management. She's a molecular biologist, she's a science journalist, a television producer, and her expertise is industrial ecology. And she's going to talk, indeed. Um, a, she gives us a clear picture on how cities can be structured to be more like biological metabolisms, like the her polydome. It's going to be exciting. Eva, over here. Hi, everyone. Wow, it's really bright here. <laughs> so I am going to talk about polydome, the thing that John just mentioned, which I'm very excited about. But what I do want to start with is a little bit of a zooming out, because obviously we're all here talking about sustainability and sustainable solutions for the future and cities, et cetera. There's a lot of interconnections between what everyone has been saying. Um, but sometimes it's useful to step back a little bit to a deeper level or a higher level and really think about why we're talking about this and what's the fundamental motivation. And that's something that I've been doing over the last couple of months as well. Um, and I want to share some of this reframing that I've been doing with you. Um, and to start with, uh, with that, um, I'm going to go back to sort of my early realizations about why sustainability is such a big deal. I was um, originally not at all into sustainability. As a, I, I'm a product of history like everybody else. My parents emigrated from communist Poland to New York City um, in the late 70s and early 80s. And they were much more, they were really entirely focused on how do we uh, achieve the American dream and how do we make um, this uh, you know, economy here work for us and all of that. And that mentality was really something that was put into me. Um, so when I went to university as a mo to study molecular biology, I was really interested in going into that track and becoming a scientist. But um, soon after, uh, early in my studies, I ran into what you guys see behind me right now. These graphs, these are hockey stick curves, um, they show the underlying trends in many different areas from social to biological um, to phys physical that are actually producing the sustainability crisis. So here, the, um, the biggest underlying one, of course, is population, which is driving everything else. And we see CO2 concentration, temperature, the use of resources like paper, water, transport, um, and all of the uh, ecosystem effects as well, uh, including up to a loss of 75% of uh, ocean biodiversity. And of course, when I saw this, and being in a biology lab all the time and growing cells and realizing that they also grow using this exponential pattern, but you know, for the first 23 hours it's okay, and then the last half hour you have like a five minute window to harvest them before they all consume everything and die. That's the nature of exponential growth patterns, is that you have this rapid collapse. And this has had effects on all of our um, living sort of uh, human systems as well. So some of the major effects that we're all aware of, population that will be affected by water shortages, 50%, arable land remaining five of, uh, around 5% of what we had, uh, and we need to grow our population quite a lot um, from then, remaining fish stocks, remaining oil reserves, et cetera. So you can go on and on with this kind of thing. The picture is quite dire, and what we really, uh, what most people who are aware of this immediately respond to, uh, you know, in seeing this is, gosh, I need to do something. This is uh, frightening. Uh, it's stressful. How do I respond to it? What do I do? And um, this, the typical solution that we've seen in society right now, and of course there, there are a lot of broader solutions, but what we've seen are a lot of um, object-oriented responses which really focus on usually one piece of the, of the pie, let's say. Look at energy optimization or material optimization and uh, try, to, try to deal with that in a, in a kind of limited context. Here are just a couple of examples. So this is bioplastic. We see it all over the place. Uh, one of the unintended consequences of bioplastic, and there are several, is that, for example, if you, as a well-intentioned consumer, put this into a recycling waste stream where you have proper plastics, you contaminate the entire stream of plastic and make it completely unusable. Um, 
also composting of this material is not uh, as easy as they say. So if you want to industrially compost this in uh, 90 degrees uh, Celsius for two months, then you can get it to degrade, but otherwise it's just waste. This is a pretty famous example as well. Uh, we've been encouraged broadly to move to CFL lighting because of the energy savings. But in fact, CFL lights are also called mercury lamps. And uh, we're introducing a neurotoxin in pretty high concentration into our homes, which is something that we most decidedly do not want. So focusing on one aspect of a problem rather than taking a systemic perspective can often have these very unintended consequences. Uh, another example is the idea of an eco-home and all of these standard certifications that we see all the time, like BREAM and LEED. Uh, the idea is that, okay, if you follow these things and you build this perfect eco-home that has all of these uh, amazing properties, then you've created something sustainable. But in fact, imagine putting that eco-home in the middle of uh, a place that's very inaccessible. And then the person who lives there has to drive there or get themselves there and their resources there every day for however long that thing will be in use. And that very quickly can overuse the amount of resources that were intended to be there to begin, uh, well, that the house would have used if it was not an eco-home. So the conclusion is basically that this is not, sustainability is not a property of objects, it's a property of systems. And in order to design truly sustainable solutions, we really have to look at the entire system when making these decisions. Otherwise, we create sub-optimizations and new externalities that we never really wanted to make. Um, so this is kind of like a metaphor. Basically, if you look at our, uh, our society as a machine, what we're doing right now a lot of the time is taking out gears and replacing them with ones that are working slightly better um, and making the machine run faster. But in fact, what we should be doing is redesigning the entire machine, re-engineering it to begin with, and having it retooled to make something better. Um, and here I put like happiness and health and community because this is what we should be focusing on producing rather than stuff. So we have all of these different problem areas and they're all connected and whenever we solve a problem, we're affecting all of them at once. And how do we actually address that? Um, I'm representing uh, Accept Integrated Sustainability. I'm co-director there. And um, this is a company that's actually entirely focused on creating these system level solutions to these problems. And we've developed our own way of thinking about it and how, how to actually approach, you know, how do we make solutions that are actually good and not just incrementally better? And how do we do it systematically so that it's not a hit or miss thing, so that every time we know that we're following a process that might lead to something suitable? Um, so one of the fundamental things about the way that we've chosen to work is that we have all of these different disciplines working together. We bring them together at, at specific points in time to, in a problem solving process, and we have a methodology for um, sustainable problem solving. Uh, here's just a little bit about the company. This is the method that we use, it's called SID. Uh, symbiosis and Development, um, and it was co-developed by me and my partner, Tom Boschardt. And this is a picture of our awesome office, which is a co-workspace in the center of Rotterdam that we also started as a project. Um, so we, we have these sort of principles that we approach in our work. Um, and if you look at the, the company as a whole, we have our head office is in Rotterdam, uh, and the blue dots show where all of our projects are. So we've really been working quite broadly across sectors and in different geographic areas and yeah, some of our areas of work, but anyway. Um, just quickly, rather than looking at the object level, uh, which we start with, so we look at the object, um, but we don't look at people, planet, profit, we look at a much broader range of, of uh, areas of concern, and we also look at it as a system, so with a system boundary and looking at changes over time, space, and context. And then we also look at the network level, and we have a bunch of indicators that we consider on the network level, like diversity and complexity and all of these factors that really affect how a system works properly and how a solution will fit into a behavioral context as well. And then we look at the system level where the ultimate indicator is sustainability. So by building it up in this way, you can actually consistently or more consistently come to solutions that don't sub-optimize. So it's integrated sustainability because it considers all aspects. And um, for us, sustainability, and I've heard this said in a few other talks today, it's not the property of an object. You can't say this is a sustainable whatever. Um, it can only be the property of a system, according to our view. <laughs> so anyway, just to make this a little more concrete, because I know that this can get high level and abstract, one example of a project that we released last year, which we developed using this methodology, is Polydome. Um, Polydome was uh, partly funded by Innovation Network, which is a program of the Dutch Ministry of Agriculture, and it's an entirely new approach to agricultural production in greenhouses. 
So the status quo in the world right now for industrial agriculture are monocultures. Um, over the course of the Green Revolution and uh, since then, the entire focus of the world's industrial agricultural system has been on producing very large volumes of one thing in one space. This is optimal in terms of money, but it's not optimal at all if you look at other factors. So imagine you're a bug that likes to eat wheat and you run into a field of wheat. Think about how quickly you're gonna spread through that, like fire on dry grass. Um, and that's, wh that's one sub-optimization. We've had to actually increase the number of chemicals that we use. Um, well, we've increased the number of chemicals that we use for pest protection 20-fold, but our crop losses are actually higher than before chemicals were introduced. They're now around 13%, whereas before the introduction of chemicals, they were 7%. And there are a number of other sub-optimizations. This is one other example. This is a picture that we made of all the produce coming into one supermarket in Rotterdam. Uh, one day in November in 2009. So you can see also the sort of sensitivity of the system and its reliance on all of these resources that we know are not all that stable, either physically or economically necessarily. So the result of that, when we applied this process, the SID methodology, first we started out with doing a lot of data mapping. So here are some of the pictures that we did, uh, that we made to uh, understand what we were uh, working with. We looked at 400 different crop varieties and we looked at all their different needs and inputs and outputs and niches and where they could possibly be placed. And we tried to create a system where we would create as much symbiosis as possible and as many connections between material flows as we could. Um, and this, this image is one of our material flow graphics that shows how all of these connections would be fitting together. So we had 50 different crops, uh, two types of mushrooms, fish, chicken, bees, insects, all working in a, in a system where you're maximizing, you're basically creating a li living ecosystem in a, in a greenhouse. Here are some of the other maps that we made, so looking at lifespans of perennial crops. This is a spatial map where we looked at how different heights and water demands would, would match together. And ultimately what we created was this complete concept of an ecosystem greenhouse with symbiotic functioning. This also has many benefits on a social level for farmers, for example, um, because rather than selling one crop, uh, one bulk crop at low prices, they can sell many niche crops at higher prices and get, those, uh, get that money directly. Right now, farmers are being squeezed by the entire supply chain. And also imagine being a laborer, rather than having to you know, harvest 20 hectares of tomatoes, you are actually taking care of a living ecosystem as a result. So Polydome is one example of how systemic sustainability and how this approach to thinking about sustainable change um, can really work. So a couple of months ago, I was at uh, the Planet Under Pressure conference in London, and uh, I was in this participa participatory meeting, um, which not, not that many of these conferences have, and I, th I was presenting one of our projects, and I thought that you know, uh, they, they would start asking me technical questions, but instead the group of people that I was talking to started to ask me really personal stuff, like, why are you doing this? Why, why do you care? And I thought back to that initial graph uh, spread that I showed you and I thought, well, isn't it obvious? I mean, don't we all care? Don't we all, you know, the, the reason for caring about sustainability and for doing this stuff is perfectly clear. And I realized in the months, in the couple of months after that, uh, when I started thinking about this, I realized that actually my motivation for working on sustainability and I think the motivation that everybody should have is that it's actually one of the only paths towards true personal freedom in the current society that we have where we're all stuck in this massive machine with all of these interacting cogs and wheels and we, you know, un without control, uh, have to perform in a certain way. In lo uh, it's a, it's a locked-in environment. And I think that reconceptualizing sustainability as this path towards freedom is only really possible when you look at that system level and not at the object level. Typically right now we think about, you know, uh, how inconvenient and expensive and what a responsibility and, uh, you know, it's ex expensive but, uh, but necessary to focus on sustainable solutions. That's sort of the status quo attitude. It's, it's kind of like it's all unfortunate. But in fact, I think it's really an inspiring direction that we should be embracing with all of our energy. Um, and it's, of course, it's easy to see how it's annoying and expensive if it's all about replacing light bulbs and upgrading little technologies to get slightly uh, more efficient energy use. But if it's about changing our lives in a way that produces truly beneficial uh, solutions for all of us, then it's actually a different proposition that we're making. 
And that's the kind of thing that I um, am trying to focus and, and uh, spread the word about in general right now. So getting to this urban metabolism thing quite quickly, this is a picture of a standard urban metabolism abstracted, really uh, general. And you can see that basically the, the person in the middle here living in this home is totally dependent on these distant flows um, from far away and works for money, uh, so spends time doing that. And, and then the money returns into this big system, into like a black hole. Um, and this is the kind of system that we need to be changing. Uh, this, is, this is another abstraction showing how it could look if we really do apply all of these technologies that everyone has already been talking about. Um, you know, renewable energy on a local scale, local purchasing, et cetera. We actually reinvent the way, the structure that our society has in a way that's directly beneficial to us, that frees up our time, that uh, gives us much more flexibility to pursue our passions. Imagine why you would work if you didn't have to worry about food, water, energy, or the basic sort of expenses that sustain your life. You would work purely out of passion and interest. And that is something that I think we should be trying to achieve in our world at large. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, this is, I'm, I'm going to go through this really quickly. This is actually a project that we did that tried to apply these technologies in, a, in an existing neighborhood. So this map here shows all of the, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit small, so you can't read it. But we really, we looked at like, how do you take all of these existing technologies and put them into a system in an existing social housing urban neighborhood in Rotterdam, in this case, and do it in a cost-effective way so that you can provide full energy, uh, full water, and a large part of the food supply for, an, uh, for a real neighborhood. And it's completely feasible and realistic. Um, and then we envisioned how that would actually look in terms of uh, social program as well. So if you put in a greenhouse, it's not just for generating energy, it's also for providing indoor recreation space for people and uh, you know, perhaps the kindergarten, different things that people in that neighborhood actually need. So you can create these integrated things with multiple values. And this is how this kind of solution could actually look. Um, right now, as part of this direction, uh, of moving towards this sustainable um, action path. Um, I'm starting a new company that's going to be a complementary parallel uh, body to accept. And it's going to be focused on directly applying these sustainable ideas in real communities with real people. One of the first projects that we're going to do is in Amsterdam North, we're looking uh, to set up an office, which will be like a sustainability um, playground, like a, a, a clean tech playground, so to speak, where all of these technologies are applied and there's a fabrication workshop. People are invited to come and actually look at how this is done and, and are given the tools directly to be able to go home and apply this if they want. And we're looking at different scales, so from individual home to community to larger scale. And the reason that I put these developing world photos here is because if you look at the cost of a biogasifier unit for a home in Nepal, it's $300. This is something that all of us can afford. And this is the kind of level at which we need to be thinking about taking personal motivation and applying it to bringing these technologies over to our homes. So that's, um, that's the conclusion, the inspirational message, and thank you very much. Thanks, Eva. I wish we could Talk, but I a lot up all longer, my time. but I have to. I have yeah. to go on. Uh, absolutely wonderful talk. Thanks very, very much. Thank and you. I, I'm sure everybody thought it was very, very inspiring. So you see how much we can do.